and we'll give it five seconds of silence and then we'll start. Thank you. Kia ora from New Zealand and a warm welcome to everyone joining us from around the world in many different time zones. My name is Amanda Ellis. I am a proud former World Bank employee, previously ran the New Zealand Development Agency and was ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva. I'm absolutely thrilled to be with everybody today for this very important 2021 launch of the groundbreaking World Bank report, Women, Business and the Law. This is the seventh report using data from 190 countries to measure how the law impacts women's ability to be economically active. It is extraordinary to say the least that there are still over 1,600 discriminatory laws, which makes no economic sense. So this is such important work. The UN Secretary General Guterres underscored just last week that gender inequality is the most pervasive human rights violation of all. And World Bank President David Malpass reminds us women must be at the center of our efforts towards an inclusive and resilient recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So it is a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Carmen Reinhardt, who is World Bank Vice President and Chief Economist. Carmen also leads the Development Economics Department, which has produced this brilliant report. Carmen is one of the most accomplished economists of her generation. In fact, she has been ranked as one of the top economists worldwide based on her publications and citations. And while her expertise is specifically in financial crisis and debt, she also is a very successful female professional and so can relate to many of the issues that we will be discussing today. Carmen, welcome, and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Amanda, for your kind introduction and uh, welcome uh, everyone joining us here today for this, this, this launch of uh, Women, Business and the Law 2021 report. Uh, the fortunate part is that we have uh, before us a very thorough and first rate report. The unfortunate part is that we have to have such reports uh, at this day and age uh, when common sense should have dictated uh, that that uh, equality uh, e equality is something that was so basic. So on that note, uh, Gender equality is, is really critical at this juncture. It's always critical, but it will be critical uh, to resilient recovery from COVID and post-COVID growth. Um, no country uh, can achieve its potential uh, without the participation, equal participation of women and men. Um, establishing equal opportunities uh, in the law makes, as I noted, economic sense, but it's also, of course, a matter of human dignity uh, and human rights. Um, but women, however, in 88 countries cannot do the same jobs as men. Uh, the jobs, whether they're in transport, manufacturing, construction, mining, uh, these jobs pay more. And even where women can do the same jobs, uh, they're paid less. In 100 countries, it's legally acceptable to pay women less for equally valued jobs. Uh, in 38 countries, a woman can be fired just because she's pregnant. Uh, although more than half of the countries measured uh, mandate paid leave for fathers, the median duration is a week. Uh, only 44 economies have paid parental leave. Uh, women cannot achieve equality in the workplace if they're on an equal footing at home. Um, in fact, uh, in about 
180, uh, the overwhelming majority of the 190 of the countries measured, they have at least one legal barrier that puts women uh, on unequal legal, unequal legal standing uh, with uh, male, their male counterparts. The, you know, upon what was already an uneven playing field, an unlevel, un, not a level playing field, COVID pandemic has uh, threatened to reverse the progress in uh, gender uh, equality. The pandemic has ex exacerbated inequalities that disadvantage women. Uh, this is also a note uh, in another World Bank report on poverty and shared prosperity, uh, leaving them economically insecure, threatening their health and their safety. With about 740 million women globally in informal employment, and the majority of them employed in services, women are particularly hard hit by the crisis. Uh, women often face lost opportunities and reduce financial independence, there's school closures, increased unpaid family care responsibilities, and heightened risk of disease exposure due to their role as caregivers and health workers. I would pause here and say that if one reads on the night, the impact on women of the 1918 in, uh, Spanish influenza it is uh, an, an appalling eye opener. Uh, this crisis, by the way, is also, this is a point I make all the time in my presentations, is also very regressive in every form. And unfortunately, women make up a large share of the world's poor. So there's real concern that we will see setbacks on the gains bid over the last few decades when it comes to gender equality. Uh, many of the gains in financial inclusion came from microfinance in the form of small loans, but because of the strain that the economies will see in their coming credit crunch, something I've been writing about, uh, the greater caution uh, firms become risk averse in lending. So there's a real concern that uh, women and female entrepreneurs will be in the front line of getting the cutbacks on uh, credit availability, making it harder for them to survive the crisis. Uh, women business and the law data show that in 108 countries, bank can discriminate based on gender and there's no legal remedies for women in this case. Think about this in the context of the current crisis. A legal environment that encourages women's economic inclusion can make them less vulnerable in the face of crisis and we need that now. Reforms are happening, but they're not really fast enough. I really want to thank the team from the bottom of my heart for producing this very important piece of research. I can imagine the challenges in producing this report in current circumstances, particularly given how the pandemic is affecting women's economic participation in real time. Women, business, and the law data and research are key in making the economic case for gender equality. This year's report updates the data considering reforms and laws and regulations that occurred over the last year. While progress has been made, the pace of reforms needs to be accelerated. Today, women still have only three quarters of the legal rights afforded to men and makes no sense. Women must be at the center of our efforts in a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. Reforming laws, uh, to achieve greater equality should remain a priority for governments uh, as governments adopt measures to recover uh, from the COVID crisis. So this is a call to action here. Spread the message, change the law. Thank you for paying attention to this very important issue. I invite all of you to read the report and disseminate its findings widely in your networks and those of you who work on legal reforms, I urge you to consider removing discriminatory laws and reform towards gender equalities. Our economies and societies stand to benefit tremendously in the face of such change. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. As you underscored, gender equality is always critical, but even more so with COVID. 
with inequalities being exacerbated. So I love your closing. Spread the word, change discriminatory law. That's our catch cry. Thank you so much. And this data set really does offer both objective and measurable benchmarks for global progress. And I think that's what makes it such an incredibly valuable report. It was prepared, as you noted, during the global pandemic. And this is real tribute to the team and to all of the lawyers that they consult around the world. So I'm really delighted now to be able to introduce the leader of the team who has produced this important report, Thea Trumbuch. And I wanted to, to say that just before she speaks, one of the main findings of the new report as you mentioned, Carmen, is just how slow progress is on commitments to gender equality under the law, despite the Universal Declaration in Human Rights, despite the promises made under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, despite the Beijing Platform for Action, the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. So, with still over 1,600 discriminatory laws on the books, as you say, it makes no economic sense. And it's wonderful to know that the team is really doing this work and that many of our panelists are going to be giving us good news today. So for me, the findings were pretty shocking, but with some positive highlights. And I'm so excited now to introduce Thea Trumbuch, who is the program manager of Women, Business and the Law. Taya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amanda. Let me start with a big thank you to the more than 2,000 respondents who contributed their time and expertise to our research. Without your local knowledge, we would not be able to raise awareness about the inefficiencies of the laws today and the inadequacies of gender equality around the world. But it has been a challenging year for everyone and especially for the world's women. In times of crises, a legal environment that encourages equal economic inclusion can make us more resilient and less vulnerable to shock. But the reality is that all over the world, women are at a disadvantage. Discriminatory laws are holding women back from reaching their full potential, threatening not only their economic security, but that of their communities and countries. Let me just share my presentation now so I can tell you exactly what I'm talking about. As we have heard already, the World Bank Group knows that no country can achieve its true potential without the equal involvement of women and men. That is why at Women, Business and the Law, we set out to identify where exactly laws, where we, oh, sorry, excuse me. That's why at Women, Business and the Law, we set out to identify where exactly laws are preventing women from working and running successful businesses. Over the last 11 years, Women, Business and the Law has presented a unique data set that measures progress towards gender equality in the world of work in 190 economies. Our data identifies where discriminatory laws persist in these eight areas affecting different stages of women's professional lives and highlighting opportunities for reform. But why does it matter? Our research builds evidence on the critical link between gender equality and economic outcomes. We know more today about the importance of gender equality than we used to. It is important because women are human beings and these are human rights issues, but also because there are economic benefits to equality. Our analysis shows that where laws treat women more equally, we see more women working, but we also see them working better jobs and receiving higher wages. And this year we present also some analysis showing that where we see more equal laws, we also see more female parliamentarians. But though we have learned a lot about the benefits of gender equality over the last several decades, there is more work to be done to really reap its benefits. Women, Business and the Law 2021 shows that worldwide, the average woman has just three fourths the legal rights of the average man. The global average score is just 76.1. But there's great variation between and within regions. 
If you look at this chart, you see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East and North Africa, we see the largest within region variation in scores, more than 60 points difference between the best and worst scoring economies. We must continue to push for gender equality everywhere. The biggest takeaway from this is that every region has examples of economies whose governments are implementing good practice laws and all regions have room to improve. Governments looking to reform can look to their neighbors for examples or inspire others in their region to reform. This year, we have 10 countries where men and women are on equal legal standing across the areas measured. Ireland introduced the reform on parental leave, and Portugal equalized the remarriage process for men and women, joining eight other countries, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Latvia, Luxembourg, and Sweden that score 100. But that means that 95% of countries have remaining gaps between men and women. Legal gender gaps are especially persistent in the areas of pay and parenthood. As Carmen had pointed out, women deserve equal pay and choice of jobs. But fewer than half of the economies worldwide have mandated equal pay for work of equal value. And in 88 economies, we still see laws restricting the jobs women can hold. Only 44 economies have paid parental leave. Childcare needs to be a shared responsibility between parents if we are to see gender equality in the world's work. This is a difficult time for any country to reform. And yet, despite the pandemic, 27 countries across all regions reformed their laws to increase gender equality. And they are reforming in the areas that need it most, pay and parenthood, and also in the regions that need it most, 25% of the Middle East and North Africa region reformed. But what is interesting is that we also see reform continue in the OECD high income region, which as we saw was the highest scoring region. So it's not enough to just reach a certain level, we need to get to 100. If we expand and look over the last 50 years, we can really see the path of change in each country and region towards gender equality. All regions have improved, have improved and in the right direction but at different speeds. Middle East and North Africa region reformed the most in recent years, which is so encouraging. But progress has been slow and uneven. Based on an annual increase in the average women business in the law index, high income OECD countries, if they continue reforming, could see gender equality in the law as soon as 2025. But it would take another 60 years to reach it in the Middle East and North Africa, the region the furth which is the furthest behind. But if the last year has taught us anything, it is that we cannot wait that long. The need for reform is even more urgent today because the COVID-19 pandemic has widened longstanding gender inequalities around the world. Analysis of new data from World Bank's enterprise surveys reveals a larger drop in the share of female full-time employees relative to male full-time employees. The gender pay gap has also widened and women are more likely than men to take leave from work resign their positions to care for family members or because of their restricted mobility. During our research this year, we found that some governments have put in place measures to address the impacts of the pandemic on working women, especially in the areas of childcare, access to the court systems and protecting women from violence. But these efforts are not enough. Governments still have room to enact measures and policies aimed at addressing the root causes of this inequality and violence towards women. A legal environment that encourages and incentivizes women's work can make them more resilient, not only in the face of crises, but throughout their lives and careers. You can learn more about our data and research on our newly revamped website. I encourage you to download and read our report, use the data in your own research, your own advocacy, and your own policy making. I just gave you a global picture. Sorry, just to finish, um, I wanted to say I gave you a global picture of what the world looks like, but it will take local action to make change happen. Legal and regulatory reforms can serve as an important catalyst to improve the lives of women everywhere. In this pandemic that continues to threaten the progress that we have made, reforms ensuring equality of opportunity are more important than ever. And the law is only the first step, it doesn't stop there. 
Imagine what a robust and prosperous world we would have if all people had the same opportunity to contribute. Thank you. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Taya. It is critical to have this kind of detailed analysis so that governments are really able to act on it. And congratulations to the top 27 reformers and to Ireland and Portugal for joining the top 10. But as you say, 95% of countries still have change to make. Now, Taya, one of the very interesting new findings was the correlation between numbers of women in parliament and the kind of reforms positive reforms that you referenced. And that is actually a response to a question already in the chat from Zachary, who asked, is there a correlation between more women in decision making and policy making positions and more policies that cater to women's needs as employees and entrepreneurs? So very exciting to see this new data. So we can say, yes, Zachary, it absolutely is. <laughs> so thank you so much. Now, I am very pleased to introduce all of our wonderful speakers. So we have an incredible panel here today to act as discussants on the research that Taya has just shared. Experts, leading experts from the private sector, from civil society and from government who will share their perspectives on how laws impact women in the world of work and at home and address the challenges and opportunities that still remain, especially in the context of the global pandemic. So I'm very pleased to briefly introduce our wonderful panel, and then I'm going to ask each of them a question, including questions from the chat. So please be active in the World Bank live chat room. So Dr. Mari Pangestu, Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank Group. Mari was previously Minister of Trade and Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy in Indonesia. She has also taught economics at the University of Indonesia and as a fellow at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. Mr. Saskia Walden, who serves as Minister of Economic Affairs, Entrepreneurship and technological innovation. What a fantastic combination of Suriname. And Minister Walden is also an expert in accounting and finance and has previously worked for the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Education in her country. The Honorable Salima Ahmad serves as a member of parliament of the People's Republic of Bangladesh and is also the president and the founder of the Women's Chamber of Commerce and industry of Bangladesh. Bridget Doherty, Director of Operations for BRAC International, one of the leading microfinance organizations globally. And Bridget is responsible for financial institutions, absolutely critical at this time, with a background in financial inclusion and private sector development. So I want to thank you all for your professional and personal commitment to women's economic empowerment. I want to turn first to World Bank Managing Director, Mari Pangestu. Mari, how do you see the role of knowledge products like Women, Business and the Law incentivizing the dialogue around gender equality and setting the reform agenda to close the legal gender gap worldwide? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amanda. I'm very pleased to be part of this discussion today. Uh, the Women, Business and Law report is very timely and it comes at an urgent time where women have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. As we all know, they've had to leave their jobs and take care of their children. And they tend to work in jobs that do not offer equal pay or adequate social protection. And you know, with this crisis, we've all been talking about how crisis is an opportunity to address uh, past uh, structural issues, as well as looking uh, forward to the recovery and growth. So in this case, uh, how do we address laws that prevent women to have equal rights and how this has prevented full economic participation of women uh, in the economy? And as David, uh, you mentioned it, Amanda recently said, the response and recovery of COVID-19 need to put women uh, at the center of these uh, efforts. 
And uh, I think uh, many of you, uh, Carmen included, have uh, said that it's not just about the legal equality as their right, but also that it makes economic sense. Um, Carmen and Thea have explained all the dimensions of the findings, so I won't repeat the findings. But just to note that, that, that progress has been made, but there are still many areas uh, to uh, address. And I think this report is going to be very useful or you know, hopefully uh, 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 not just useful, but very relevant to help identify uh, gender differences in legal treatment and its impact on economic outcomes and generate advocacy, uh, be used by policymakers and decision makers, including legislators, for dialogue that will lead to reform. So if this is the opportunity uh, to do reforms, this is really uh, the great opportunity uh, to do so. Um, but we know that more work needs to be done. And, and so uh, we, we need to focus on where uh, the work needs to be done. Even though 27 countries reformed, uh, the average number for, the, for our Middle East and North Africa where reform has happened is only 50%. So only 50% of women uh, have equal rights as men, uh, in, even in those that um, are reforming. So progress on four areas is needed to ensure equal economic participation, in my view. One is uh, closing remaining gender gaps, including girls' completion of secondary schooling and boys. Uh, dropout rates and in health. And we know that the return to school by girls is much lower than boys uh, based on past crisis. So we really need to prioritize this. And uh, we are already seeing evidence of um, uh, girls being married below age. You know, part of a lot of that is uh, for economic reasons as well as uh, culture, but uh, definitely they will not return to school. And this is, I think, one uh, really urgent area we have to focus on. Remove constraints to more and better jobs for women, focusing on safe transport, uh, safe transport, child and el elder care, training in digital technology and skills uh, that are needed, and reducing occupational sex uh, segregation. I just want to mention something on child care because as Minister of Trade, one of my uh, tasks was to re uh, revitalize the traditional markets. And when I first started going to these markets, I noticed that women uh, were, you know, there were children running around as they were working. And so one of the things I did in the right revitalization program was to design childcare facilities as well as the bathroom. The other thing was the bathroom. The ba they had equal size bathroom for men and women, despite the fact that 90% of the, of the traders were women. So we, you know, we designed it with, uh, with women in mind to, to really improve the workplace. Third, remove barriers to women's ownership and control of productive assets like land and housing and improve access to finance, technology and insurance services needed to make uh, assets productive. I think we talk a lot about land or having uh, being able to open bank accounts. I just want to mention intellectual property, right? Uh, the, the, the women need to understand uh, that they need to protect their uh, intellectual property rights. I had, as a Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy, I had a really awful example where uh, this woman, she designed shoes and she became very famous and the brand was her name. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, she got an investor who basically took over that, that name. So she couldn't, afterwards when she uh, decided that she didn't want to work with this investor anymore, she couldn't use the name, her name as the shoe brand. She had to create uh, another uh, brand. So I think I just wanted to emphasize uh, that story it still sticks to me. And I think that's a very crucial uh, area. Finally, women's voice and agency, including by engaging men and boys, to tackle uh, all these challenges related to child marriage, gender-based violence, social norms, and women's participation in government. Women need to be part of the decision-making, as well as you know, having the mindset, as, as my example showed you, that we uh, need to be there uh, to make sure that uh, everything has uh, go, is through a gender lens. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I think, uh, a, a very crucial I just close with a final example because it still sticks to me uh, 20 years later. I went to Ethiopia uh, and we visited a village. This was part of my earlier work, uh, working with the UN Millennium Goals. And uh, we, we, we went to the village and they had received funds from the government to improve the village. And, uh, and it was discussed who, who made the decision to use the money. If the men had uh, decided to uh, what they wanted to use the money for, they would choose a parabola 
because so they could watch football. You ask the women, they said, we want to build a pipe that uh, connects the river to our village so that we don't have to walk back and forth uh, to carry the water. And, and the women uh, won the day, uh, thankful to say. So that's a, just a very simple example to tell you the importance of women uh, in decision making. I'll, I'll close on that note. Thank you, Mari. And I'm so pleased to hear that women did win the day. <laughs> you really illustrated why it's so important for women to have a seat at the table and the importance of using the report to generate advocacy. Uh, when I was ambassador to United Nations and to the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the group of women ambassadors and heads of agency would get together before each country was examined on the human rights record, including gender equality. And it was so important for us to have the data from women, business and the law. So I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, thank you, Taya and team for this very important work. And now uh, I would like to turn to Saskia Walden from Suriname. One of the key findings in the report this year is that the laws affecting women's work after having children as measured in the parenthood indicator remained high on the reform agenda. And everybody has highlighted the importance of this. Five economies reformed in this area over the last year, and Suriname was one of them. So congratulations. Previously, Suriname was one of only six economies worldwide without any paid leave related to the birth of a child. But in late 2019, the Family Employment Protection Act was passed and it introduced 16 weeks of paid maternity leave and eight days of paid paternity leave. So very enlightened. Minister Walden, Congratulations, please share with us what were the drivers of this reform and what else is the government of Suriname doing to encourage more women's participation in the economy? Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Indeed, we are very content with the improvements in Suriname's legal system and a law enabling women to be more able to contribute to the economy. Uh, there were many significant drivers to enact law which facilitates women's work after having children. Primarily, government takes an important step to a safeguarding our economy when the legal environment encourages and incentivizes women's work. You know about 50% of our, our population consists of women. Women are daughters, sisters, mothers, and mostly also the caretakers of both men and women. Suriname is blessed with many valuable natural resources. Yet, you would agree with me that human resources are the most important of resources a country could have. So, and the government acknowledges the importance of women in the workforce. So when women are given the same opportunities as men, they enter and remain in the labor force, strengthening the economy and enabling sustainable development growth, sustainable economic development. So this is one of the most significant drivers to enact law which facilitates women's work. Especially in an era where more and more Surinamese women are seeking and also given access to formal and higher education. You know that when women are given the opportunity to become educated and develop skills, we tend to learn well and excel in the studies. So we understand that the Family Employment Protection Act provides a measure of job security and thus enabling women to stay part of the workforce, implement the skills and contribute to our economic development, even after having children. It's no other way around that the women are all most of, often, we are, the women are the one getting pregnant. So they are the one having to bear children. So government supports gender equality with women counting for about half of our population, 50%. The government knows that gender equality in the law is also associated with fighting poverty and achieving better economic development achieving sustainable economic growth. 
is the main, so we're talking about sustainable economic development, is the main driver behind reforms in Suriname. Women are equally important to men. And when they remain part of the workforce after having children, our economy will grow faster. There's also, I also want to say, mention something uh, uh, about the uh, traditional, we are still facing some challenges in Suriname though, because uh, traditionally women are the caretakers of babies, children, and also the elderly. And uh, like was in Suriname, we still have culturally many matriarchal families where women are at the head of the family. And uh, I would say sometimes unfortunately, also the sole uh, income earner in families. So, and though, although women have those strong roles in those in patriarchal families, it doesn't really seem to transfer to formal employment. So children and women seem to have uh, yet to achieve equal employment opportunities in leadership positions. Leadership, leadership positions in large organizations are considered to manage significant projects overseeing large sums of money or other executives role. So there's also still a gender pay gap in Suriname. So those discrepancies in remuneration on equal pay rates between men and women for work of equal value are still a challenge to be solved. But I have to say that Suriname is on the right track. Our president Santoki has encouraged more women to be politically involved. And when women are also engaged in the political process, they are also able to help establish laws which makes women's rights more favorable. So President Satoki has placed women in the positions to solve the challenges faced in changing the culture and perception around reforms in Suriname. The government of Suriname supports women's political representation as it is necessary for favorable women's rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, for being a wonderful role model and for pointing out that this is such a critical economic issue. You also remind us that we need male champions. So please thank your president on our behalf very interesting to think about the findings of this year's report. And I would like to think that they also have influenced the new chair of the US Federal Reserve, who no doubt was looking at your reforms. But just last week, he called on Congress to improve childcare provision in the US. Uh, so it's, it's not only developing countries, but also developed countries that are needing to make progress and are looking to these important issues. So thank you so much, Minister. Now, wanting to turn to another issue, Salima, you are a successful entrepreneur who really beat the odds and you've been so active to advocate and support other women through founding the Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Bangladesh. So there are a whole range of areas that I know have impacted you. Barriers to women's mobility, reduces opportunities to build networks with other entrepreneurs and to exchange vital information on market opportunities. And we know that this is a real break on women achieving their full potential as successful entrepreneurs. But there are barriers to employment and entrepreneurship at every stage of life that limit equality of opportunity. And I love the life cycle approach that the Women, Business and the Law team is taking now. These icons make it so easy to actually follow through the life cycle. And then with the great data that there is on the website, actually be able to drill down and see where the specific changes need to be made. 
So you are just a wonderful example yourself about this journey. And I would love it if you could share some of your experience as a female entrepreneur in Bangladesh, the obstacles that you have faced in your path to becoming a successful entrepreneur and what it was that spurred you to found the Chamber of Commerce and help over, I think it's now over 52,000 other women entrepreneurs, which is just extraordinary. Salima, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with <clears throat> such a wonderful woman and congratulations for the report. Uh, yeah, um, I had a rough, tough, but very pleasant journey. I was married when I was 16 years old. I became a mother when I was 70. But you know, the fear, the insecurity, the complex, which I have seen with my mother or my grandmother or the elderly woman, um, that they were not educated, they were not economically important. I didn't want to put myself into that shoe. So I continued my studies. I did my graduation, I did my master's. But then I thought, what next? Because I have to do something for army and job. It is too lengthy, too much time consuming, but I wanted to earn money. So I, I uh, started business first with some of my university friends, later on with my husband. And then when we were successful, uh, I established the first artificial silk flower industry in Bangladesh. And the obstacles was that Oh, you are a woman, you're doing business. When I used to go to the customs office, they used to look, where is the man? Who, who is she? What she's doing here? When I used to travel in the, at the immigration, they used to look at my passport and say, oh, you're traveling alone? Oh, you're in your passport, it is mentioned in profession business. What business? So the question was uh, in a, such a way that it doesn't fit me. When I was in, in export trade fair in London or USA or Australia, you know, they're all men and like everyone is looking at me, what she's doing here. But, you know, I am here to do business and that's what I did. So I joined uh, as a, as a, as a, in the Apex trade body of, uh, in Bangladesh. And that journey, I found so many less women uh, uh, into that trade body. And also microcredit was, uh, you know, uh, in Bangladesh uh, of, uh, for different microcredit institutions. But I never wanted to see women in the micro position. Why women will be treated like as a charity? Why women will be treated as a micro? Why can't we be like Bill Gates or, or anyone, you know? So uh, then I thought, you know, we need to have that inclusion. We need to bring over woman into that arena and how that by forming a chamber of commerce for women and again then there was a fight and also obstacles by the men business community why a separate chamber of commerce for women and why not and we started our own chamber we started off seeing that inclusiveness because that's very important for social development. That is very important for any country development. And women need opportunities. And that is access, access to market, access to finance, access to all sort of gender friendly environment. So we started public policy dialogue uh, and public private dialogue also uh, to do policy advocacy. And as I said, micro entrepreneurs was there, but when they want to do a bigger business, there was no bank loan uh, because you need to give collateral and mostly we don't have assets in our name. Uh, <clears throat> so what we did, we lobbied uh, with the central bank and we are very fortunate. Our honorable prime minister, Sheikh Hasan, she's very gender friendly. She always wanted to see us that we are equal than men. So that also helped us uh, to, to bring a policy, which was that women entrepreneurs can get about $25,000 loan without collateral and the lowest rate of interest in the country. That gave it really, really big mileage. But also then we found out that even if we have access to finance, our capacities need to be developed. 
if we don't build our capacity, then you know, we don't know how to manage our business. So again, we lobby to the government to allocate a separate allocation in the national budget. And that was again allocated. Of course, we had to do that lobbying for five years, but we got that that again helped us to build the capacity of women entrepreneurs. So as I say that, you know, if you give little opportunities, if you can uh, include uh, the woman uh, into entrepreneurship, that is the best way to uh, to bring women uh, into the mainstream. And for a country like Bangladesh, where 2 million people looks for job, who's going to create these jobs? Entrepreneur. And that cannot be only men entrepreneur. Why not us? And we not only create jobs, we, whatever the money actually we have, we invest in our, our children, we invest with our, our elderly people, we invest in the uh, society. And that really, uh, you know, give a huge mileage for the country. And I think the best options for any woman is to go for entrepreneurship. But for that capacity building is important. And you know that that uh, women are vulnerable, but little interventions are, are also very important. So to make things work on the ground, local leadership is also important. It is important to remember that business is not just, just multinational companies, but also domestic companies, also entrepreneurs, small business entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Salima. You really do remind us that the vast majority of economic activity is through small businesses. And from my previous role as National Manager for Women in Business at Westpac, women had the same issues that you described so well. So thank you very much for being such a role model and for uplifting and supporting so many other women in Bangladesh. And of course, Bangladesh is, is famous the world over for being really the home, uh, the genesis of microfinance, because there were so many obstacles for women to overcome in, in getting traditional finance. So the, the story of BRAC and the story of Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank are well known. And we're delighted to have with us today, uh, Bridget Doherty, who is the Director of Operations of BRAC International Microfinance, and really uses a very holistic approach to poverty alleviation. So Bridget, we'd love us if you could tell us about what BRAC International is doing and legal barriers that some of your clients are facing in growing beyond microfinance. And I have been a very undisciplined moderator, so I'm just going to ask you two to keep remarks fairly short so we can do a final round uh, to hear from everybody before we close out. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Amanda. As you said, BRAC works in 11 countries across Asia and Africa, and we take a holistic approach to empower people to realize their own potential. And we deliver cost-effective, evidence-based programs, and there are many of them from from education to health to legal aid to ultra poor graduation and microfinance. And I want to talk a little bit more about BRAC International Microfinance, which has six financial institutions outside of Bangladesh. And these are in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and Myanmar. And they're serving more than 650,000 clients, 97% of whom are women. Um, these women are living on less than $3.20 a day, living in peri-urban and rural areas, and, and really operating very small businesses, selling goods and foods in local markets. And as you said, I mean, a lot of these women aren't having access to formal financial services. And for one of the reasons is because of legal barriers, because they aren't able to inherit assets and have collateral to, to avail these funds from commercial institutions. Um, and as, as the report notes, we haven't seen a change in the assets indicator um, since 2019. Um, 
And we ourselves have looked at this closely and we've carried out um, lean data impact assessments with our partner 60 decibels and with one of our investors, Global Partnerships, and only 34% of our clients have bank accounts. And 83% of them have told us that they cannot access a good alternative to BRAC. Um, so it's, it's clear that microfinance is filling a critical market gap in terms of access to finance. Um, one of the things that we are looking very closely at is women's economic empowerment. Um, and it's so essential, as everyone has noted, to grow communities. Um, and it's very important for women to retain control of their finances and really be able to manage their businesses. And to give you an example, we carried out a study at our, our, financial, our financial institution in Uganda um, with an, a with an, uh, research fellow of economics from Oxford, Emma Riley, to see how disbursement of our loans through mobile money would, would impact women. Um, and we found that disbursement of loans through mobile money accounts was most beneficial to women who felt the most pressure to share the loan with their family. And so when they received the mobile money, uh, the money into their mobile money accounts, they saw an increase in their business profits by 25% compared to a control group. So it's really critical that we also, as part of you know, looking forward for women's economic opportunities and women's economic empowerment, that we bring them along with us as we see financial technologies um, come into being and we see the prevalence of financial technologies increase um, to really ensure that we don't see these access gaps widen because we aren't, you know, working with our clients to ensure that they know how to use technology. Thank you so much, Bridget. And that really comes back to the importance of the points that were made about technology earlier as well. Uh, and it's interesting to note that the genesis of the early data sets for women business in the law really came about through some of the countries that you mentioned in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and noticing that women were unable to grow from micro beyond micro because of the legal barriers. So it is disappointing to hear that there hasn't been more progress on assets this time. So I wanted to come back now uh, very briefly to Salima because you have been active as one of the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative Leadership Champions. And this was launched in Germany a couple of years ago and has been a very important initiative that the World Bank has been involved in leading. So tell us a little bit about your successful path from an entrepreneur and the work that you did founding the Chamber of Commerce to actually becoming a parliamentarian. Uh, as I, I said earlier, really, you should be 150 for all the, the work that you have done. So tell us about how you are now helping uh, to change the laws for women now that you have a seat in Parliament. And of course, that very important finding about more women in parliaments equating to better outcomes in terms of legal equality for women. Thank you very much. You know, uh, for a Bangladeshi woman, and I think all over the world, uh, uh, although we are not homogeneous, but it's the same. It is that we do have not only these barriers in, in, in access to finance or other uh, norms, but the social uh, barriers also. And to be into the parliament, I wanted to be a part of bringing policies. Uh, when uh, uh, last year in November, uh, 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 for the ra rapist, uh, you know, the final was death penalty just passed. I was in that parliament and when I could, could say yes, you know, that day gave me the satisfaction to sit into the parliament that yes, I could be also uh, a part of that, uh, that bill. Uh, but, you know, Bangladesh uh, is graduating from LDC, as all of you know, uh, and we are looking uh, forward for that. But without women's economic participation, it is not at all uh, uh, possible. And for that, as, a, as I always believe, because we have seen that little, little policies can give a little, little step ahead. And the thing is also there are policies which are not implemented. So I can, uh, uh, you know, bring attention by giving notice to the ministers 
of different department that why you are not doing it and in the parliament they have to answer it i will not get that opportunity if i am not in the parliament and also bringing new laws so i thought this is the right place for me to sit there to send notice to the ministers and see that these things happen so uh, because policy advocacy is so important for a country like bangladesh and especially in south countries and that's why i have become a parliamentarian but i always say my love is always for women entrepreneurship because the changes in the lives of women i have seen within my 20 years journey by forming this women chamber i can smile when i'm not in this world wherever i am because so many life changes has been you know when i meet them when i sit with them these are the fighter women no education no money but they want to be equal and why we will not give them a chance thank they you so much thank you saleba it's such an important message and your personal journey is so inspiring I have only a few minutes for us left, so I would love to have everybody's brief insights on the pandemic. And I wanted to start first with Mari. What can be done to guarantee that the post-pandemic rebuild is more gender equal? Well, I think uh, our report uh, highlights where the areas for improvement and also the, the way that we are designing the response and recovery really needs to put a gender lens on everything that we do, uh, whether it's, you know, designing social protection programs that have women in mind. Uh, one of the uh, not so good results in our household survey is that women, you know, people are eating less uh, because of income losses, and it's women who, who will uh, tend to eat less. So how do we make sure women uh, don't suffer that? And how do we make sure women continue to have maternal and women health services delivery? women lose jobs more than men uh, and they are likely to uh, be predominantly employed in the informal sector lacking access to many things finance technology and so on so how do we make sure that the cash for work programs that are being designed by governments need to focus on women a lot of them are you know like infrastructure related uh, and this was something in government also myself and the, at that time, the Minister of Finance, who is now the Minister of Finance again, Sri Mulyani, we focus very much how to design uh, the, these um, programs to have women in mind. Technology, very important. Women-owned businesses are more affected uh, and less able to use technology in this pandemic as well as even before the pandemic. And then access to finance. So how do we make sure, like, uh, like um, uh, Salima was mentioning as well as BRAC, uh, our representative from BRAC, how do you make sure that women can have access to uh, 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 financing, uh, but not just access, but how to use it, uh, you know, financial literacy is, I think, equally important. Um, and uh, also the, the upgrading and skilling uh, for the technology use. And, and I think finally, uh, uh, two more points, if I may, uh, girls and women face increasing barriers to attend school. I think making sure girls back going back to school is so important because you're talking about permanent, uh, you know, uh, setback for, for many years to come. And this is something we have to avoid. Uh, you know, many studies show that if you make sure that girls are educated uh, all the way till high school or at least middle school, you will have poverty reduction uh, because the women who enter the workforce and become entrepreneurs, they will save uh, and make sure their kids go to school and so on and so forth. And finally, on uh, the rise in domestic violence, I think that's another um, uh, issue that we need to, to address. And uh, how do we make sure that uh, we, we have uh, gender-based violence reporting monitoring system uh, uh, in place? And I mean, the World Bank is working across all these areas. And we hope uh, uh, that, that with leadership such as we see today, uh, uh, with the role of the Suriname government, Bangladesh president, and community le leaders like Salima advocating for women's rights and entrepreneurs, and women-based initiative for access to finance that BRAC have developed, we, we can really move forward uh, on this agenda. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
Minister Walden, if you would like to just tell us very briefly how your government is planning to take the reform agenda forward in Suriname in light of the crisis, based on the points that Mari raised. The government provides women with tools and opportunities to be entrepreneurs and grow the families without having to choose one over the other. Of course, the COVID pandemic has uh, placed a significant strain on achieving those possibilities uh, at the speed which we had preferred or which we would like to. And uh, yet, the, besides the Family Employment Protection Act, as Minister of Economic Affairs, Entrepreneurship, and Technological Innovation, I work on providing better platforms to both women living in the city and women living in rural areas, providing equal access to financing opportunities to women in business, because finance, equal, finance, equal access to low financing especially seem to be yet a challenge to women. And we are seeking to provide low cost financing, low interest loans, flexible loans, uh, especially for women in business, we provide those opportunities. In this regard, the government is providing programs and funds for women to get access to low cost financing for the business and also guide those women in business, mainly small and medium sized enterprises. At our ministry, there's also a special department for technological innovation, which also seeks more efficient ways for women to grow the business and be more competitive on the market. Together with the Department of Entrepreneurship, we provide incubators for partnership. And those incubators for partnership uh, gives women the opportunities to work together in business to achieve economics of scale, or synergy which contribute to business growth and sustainable economic growth because as women do well in business our economic in our economy will also grow because women contribute to economic development Thank and you, Minister. oh that was just such a perfect note on which to end that as Women contribute to economic development, so the economy will grow. And thank you all so much. We are a little past the hour, and you have done a brilliant job actually responding to another question in the chat uh, from Eduardo, who was asking about examples of best practice. So thank you to, to Mari and to you for providing those examples. And uh, I am thrilled to now wrap with one final word from Bridget. Uh, to share with us before we close. Thanks, Amanda. I, I, I just want to say that if BRAC has learned, learned one thing in its 50 years of operation is that women are inherently resilient. They face shocks and crises in multitudes, and we have so much to learn from them. So as Murray said, now is the time, and Carmen said, not to be risk averse. We need to continue to get money back into the hands of women. We know that microfinance is a tool that enables women's economic empowerment, that enables financial resilience. So let's let's make sure that we we don't sort of fall into a trap of being risk averse and that we continue to get money into the hands of women. Thank you, Bridget. I think that's a perfect note on which to end the importance of remembering that women are resilient. And as Carmen said, we need to spread the word and change discriminatory laws so that we are able to have a gender-informed COVID recovery. And interestingly, McKinsey has done some analysis showing that the recovery is estimated to positively add $13 trillion by 2030 with a gender-informed recovery. So gender equality absolutely is smart economics. Taya, I wondered if you wanted to put up the slide of resources to leave everybody with as we close out our session today and just reiterate some of these wonderful lessons. Minister Walden, women are key to achieving economic growth and the support of men is absolutely essential. 
Salima, your point about policy advocacy and the importance of lobbying for change, and Mari, critical for women to have a seat at the table. And here are some resources to all of you who have been joining us from around the world. There is now a series of videos based on women, business and the law. We're in partnership with the Interparliamentary Union at the United Nations and a range of other partners. So for all of you who are parliamentarians and change makers and advocates for change, uh, please use this resource. There's also a map where you can click on other countries and you will see the wonderful summary that Women, Business and the Law has done for each of the 190 countries. The Gender Equality and Governance Index is another tool based on these resources. And so we hope that all of you will become advocates for positive change so that we can all benefit. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all our wonderful speakers and to Taya and the team at Women, Business and the Law. Thank you and goodbye.